Thank you guys so much for coming in. This is great. Thank you for us. All right, so uh, let's talk about how you guys really got started playing music together. All right. So I just moved to Winston Salem. Um, I didn't know anybody, and Eddie actually hired me at the used bookstore where I still work, and he used to work. And I hadn't been playing in a while, and really I just had used to play in orchestras and symphonies. This is really the first band I ever played with. So we started playing acoustically, just messing around like five and a half years ago or, yeah. or so. And it developed to this <laughs> eventually. <laughs> so, was there like an idea uh, when y'all started this, like of what you guys wanted mm -hmm. to do? I mean, this is—it's really unique. Well, I there was a sp specific idea. Um, I just knew—I knew I wanted to do something than the traditional band setup. You know, four people, standard drum kit, two guitars and a bass or whatnot, because you know, done that so many times before. At least for me personally. So, 
Um, the idea that we were starting with just the two of us like uh, was really nice. And probably early on, we thought we might have like you know expanded it to add more members. But we didn't, as far as like the sound, I don't know. We just like kind of like see. We just kind of looked at what we wrote together and let it develop naturally. But then we also realized that we liked the drum machine and we liked it just being the two of us. And we realized we had kind of this unique way of like writing and working together that I hadn't really had before with like you know four guys in a room. Right. Well, uh, let's go back a little bit further. Uh, Alana, you mentioned that you, you're classically trained. Uh, Eddie, what's your background in music? Well, um, I played clarinet in junior high. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I was playing guitar uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, I, I, I started playing guitar when I was 13. Actually, I can almost kind of credit my friend Jamie Gray because he was at Camelot Music buying the easy guitar tab to Appetite for Destruction. And I was like, oh, that sounds like fun, playing Appetite for Destruction at home. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, realized I had a guitar in my closet, because like many kids, my mom, uh, my mom, I come from a musical family, and my mom, you know, got me a guitar when I was in fourth grade, because I wanted to play guitar, but it's like I put it down after two months. Yeah. So luckily when I was old enough and getting into music and getting into all kinds of rock music, I opened like a closet and I had an electric guitar. So like I went, you know, straight into the electric, you no know, acoustic time for me. So uh, what kind of music did you grow up listening to? I mean, you mentioned that uh, Appetite for Destruction, <laughs> but I mean, when I listen to y'all, I hear a lot of, you know, 90s grunge influences. I mean, is that what you kind of grew well, up Well, I mean, with? definitely that was my, you know, I guess, coming of age years, you know, in the 90s. Um, I mean, I listened to, I mean, when I first started really getting into music, it was a lot of, you know, classic rock stuff, you know, The Who and The Beatles and Led Zeppelin and all that stuff. And then... I mean, yeah, the 90s came around and there was some metal I was into and then, you know, the grunge stuff was a part of it, but I kind of quickly found like Sonic Youth and My Bloody Valentine and all, and like that kind of stuff and Dinosaur Jr. I liked kind of like the squall and noise like with the pop kind of, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I just kind of sought out that stuff and then also like a lot like British stuff, you know, like the Smiths and Pulp. For some reason, those two things, like kind of like the suave, elegant, swaggery, singer, glammy stuff, and then dirty rock. I, those were the two things I really liked the most. Once I was really like cognizant of, you know, of it. So, did you guys, did you try to bring in some of those influences on your new album? We, who are we? Think you, we are. It seems like it happened. <laughs> Everybody has been drawing some yeah. '90s, '90s ties to this record. I mean, we didn't think about it. You know, and I didn't even notice it until like, lately. So many people have said, drawing that connection. You know, with this album. I mean, I guess it's just there. Yeah, I don't know that we. I don't know how to actively draw influences. <laughs> I mean, then we just like write, and um, I often think, sometimes think, oh, it must be neat to be in a band that like you, you, you have this defined like thing. I'm trying to write a record like this, or I don't know. That's not us. We just kind of write the songs, and I think all the influences maybe that we've had kind of come together. We're really not trying to. We think like the way our approach is kind of like more, has more to do with our sound than like the style of song we're writing. I think like our, our just like the way we approach it and our instrumentation is gonna like can lend itself to a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, who are we think we are is actually y'all's third release, but it's your first through thir 307 Knox, right? Right. Um, now you you had you have some incredible names attached to this this album. Mitch Easter, mm -hmm. Shidi Kumar. How did you how did you get hooked up with these guys? I mean, this is. This is really yeah, amazing. It was really, really great and lucky experience for us to have. Um, Mitch Easter, um, you know, he's from Winston Salem, so he's around where we are. He lives in Kernersville now, which is just right outside of Winston, and his awesome studio, the Fidelitorium, is right there. So, you know, we've always, of course, known him and known things he's produced and the music he's played. And we, um, our friend Richard Emmett, actually, who owns the garage in Winston Salem, I guess, put us together with him, and you know, we played some shows with him the past few years, and that was how we really got started, you know, to know him, and he expected expressed interest in working with us and we just didn't know if we'd ever if that was realistic you know yeah right we can't just go record the Fidel Torium every day but <laughs> we would love to anytime and so we then we met you know Melissa and Alicia from 307 Knox Records through some shows we played here in Durham and they really facilitated us getting together with Mitch and also with Chidi um, who was they were both so great in the studio. So yeah, I don't think we would have made that happen for ourselves. Like, you know, no. 307 Ox really did make that happen, which is awesome. And it was it's so great that he's right right by where we're based out of. It was really, really a it good made experience. Our dreams come true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mitch is such an acclaimed uh, producer. What do you think he brought to the table that any other producer couldn't have? You know what? He helped to like uh, part the murky seas for us a little bit. <laughs> I mean, meaning like we, we tend to like kind of 
sometimes fall into like kind of the wall of like sound we're creating and he kind of helped us to like I think pull out you know the songs a little bit helped us to kind of focus in on like the important aspects of songs there was really there was no like rearranging of songs or anything like that but he kind of like he just really helped us out to bring out like the you know important elements I mean I've never spent so much time on vocals before probably you know it's a thing like you always try to bury your vocals and all that kind of stuff and a lot of that has to do too with like we've you know done a lot of recording ourselves as well so like you know it's nice being able to be I'm like no this vocal needs to be loud and you both need to sing on this part or you know or you'd be like yeah no the vocal needs to sit with the guitars on this one it's a good and he just I don't know he knew when to like kind of just let us do our thing which is a yeah. lot of the time which made me feel good I'm like Mitch was that okay and he's like yeah he's really uh-huh. really awesome at capturing our sound and our energy yeah it's just so easily you know probably surely partly because he's seen us play live and he knows what we're going for and he's just his ear is so great he's just he knows what we're going for you know like a lot of people don't sometimes yeah <laughs> and we actually were able to set up live basically and record with him which that I mean I think that hardly ever happens if you don't have the right amount of space but like with us because we have electronic drum machine and everything it's always been recording in headphones and we, he's like, no, we set it up. And he put up these weird old, like, speakers from a Coliseum that closed down 20 years ago. And he was, like, blasting our drum machine beats at us through that. And we were just playing in the room together. And he had, like, you know, six mics on her bass. And it was it was great. So it was like we were playing a show. And because of that, most of the songs we did, like, in the first couple of takes, as far as, you know, the basic tracks. And I don't know. I never, like, kept basic tracks really before. <laughs> Now, uh, this album, Mitch actually recorded this album on tape, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, wh- what do you think, how, how's that different from recording, say, digitally? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think it added some kind of, like, uh, necessary pressure, sort of. <laughs> I don't know. You just, it, I mean, you can edit tape. It's not as easy. It takes a lot longer. Um, I don't know. It gives us a good feeling of having to get it right the first time. And I think we just like the idea of like, since we were coming at this different angle and with the electronic drums and everything, well, let's put it on, you know, the old technology and see where they kind of bring, it, bring the two worlds together. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, this album has just been out for a month now. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's next for you guys? I mean, are you guys going to be hitting the road soon? What are you doing? Well, um, for the summer, we're doing a lot of like just weekends out of town. We both have a lot going on outside of the band, so we're trying to maximize our time, at least go out of town a few days at a time for the summer, um, and then not till October, I think. At end of October, we're gonna go for out for a couple weeks again, probably, um, Northeast, and maybe do CMJ or something like that. So we're just kind of figuring that out. Next year will probably be a lot of touring. This year, kind of just little little bursts regionally, for the most part, kind of build up our. We're trying to like play it smarter. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's like, you know, we've gone out there and just like, go, you know, gone, you know, for a couple weeks, and it's great experience, but we're just trying to like really build up what's going around here regionally yeah. more, I think. <laughs> Yeah. 
Catholics from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. 